What is the state of our city? Good evening, everyone. I'm Linda Laurel. Welcome to Red, White and Blue. Mayor Anise Parker recently delivered her sixth and final State of the City address, a speech she called bittersweet, saying, it is a time to celebrate accomplishments, but it is also a reminder that time is running out to do more. Mayor Parker has served Houston for nearly 18 years in various governmental roles, serving the last five years as mayor and proclaiming that, quote, Houston is better off today than we were five years ago, unquote. But she acknowledges the challenges our city faces, including rapid population growth, pension obligations, and a dated infrastructure. So tonight we ask, what plans does Mayor Parker have for the city in her last few months? What are her concerns for the future of the city? And what's next for her career? Tonight, to address the state of the city, we are very honored to welcome Mayor Anise Parker. And leading our discussion, as always, our hosts, David Jones and Gary Pollard. Thank you for being here, Mayor. Glad to be with you. I think you've been here more times than anyone else. Almost as many times as you, David. That's right, exactly. <laughs> so a lot of people want to take your place, and I'm, I, I regret that you didn't pass term <coughs> limits and make it retroactive so you could be running again. Um, the newest candidate is the sheriff Harris of Harris County, Mr. Garcia. So, uh, is, is there a my question guess, there? <laughs> is it, isn't it your, is it, is it your thought that maybe since he has to be replaced by the commissioner's court before he can actually leave his job, they'll just sit, let him sit there and ruin his campaign for mayor? No, I, I, <laughs> having spoken to several members of commissioner's court, uh, they, they picked his replacement some time ago. They've just been waiting for him to fish or cut bait. Uh, I think the train has been moving pretty rapidly down the track and he's going to have to really scramble to catch up as a Democrat. I think it's unfortunate that he's turning over the one Democratic seat in Harris County to, uh, to the, the Republicans, uh, but it is what it is. Uh, I would, uh, let's move on to the state of the city, but also the state of Anise Parker, because uh, <laughs> Mayor, to be fair, you've been, in a, you've been in a leader in the city for almost 18 years. That's a long time. It is. I mean, I understand when you said uh, this comment, it was a little bittersweet that uh, you're coming to the end uh, of the service. I've been doing this full time for, for almost 18, 18 years. years. That is a long time. Uh, I guess my first question would be to you, looking looking where we're at today, what is the biggest regret you have of something you really wanted to accomplish, maybe starting back 18 years ago, that you were unable to accomplish at least to date? And of course, maybe we'll get lucky and something will change. I've actually, through each phase of my career, starting as a council member and then controller and then mayor, I came in with things that I wanted to, to accomplish and I've pretty much well checked everything off the list. The one thing, I won't consider it a failure because I never really had full control over it, but that is the pension reform for the city. It's the one thing, uh, and at this point I'm hoping for a little bit of incremental progress. If there is one thing that uh, affects the, the overall financial health of the city, that's it. And it's not something that is fully in the control of city government. It's largely controlled by the state. And, and the problem we're talking about is that the state legislature has some control over how the city of Houston pensions operate, particularly Correct. with fire and police. Uh, well, well with, with fire, it's completely under the control of the state legislature. With the municipal and the police, we have the ability to negotiate but we can't force. If the two parties don't agree, uh, the state prevails. And uh, we can't agree, and, and so, you know, the, and I will give a great deal of credit to both of those pensions, the municipal and police, for sitting down and putting in a lot of good government reforms. There's still a little ways to go, but we finally got to the point where we were down to the really hard stuff, and, and they essentially said, why would we give that up if we don't have to? And the firefighters don't have to do anything. Well, is it fair to say, Mayor, that if, if the kind of things, and you've been talking about them for a long time, that it's, yeah. a, it's a fiscal shot across the bow of the city and a potential threat to the city's stability financially long term, what do we really need to do in the world as we exist today with a pension plan for the fire department if, e if you had full control? Either, either one of them, and I, because the, actually the, the firefighter pension plan is, is almost entirely funded. It's, it's uh, very close to being fully funded, mostly because we just get an invoice every year. We don't have much uh, choice. But across all three pensions, the one reform, well, actually two reforms I would make. I would put independent fiduciaries in charge uh, right now, all three pensions are dominated by beneficiaries. 
But the other, the big change would be to stop colas, automatic cost of living uh, adjustments. Uh, I have no, I, I'm not going to get into the argument whether you should have a defined benefit or a defined contribution. I think you can have a defined benefit plan that, that makes sense, but it has to be based on what the assets of the plan are. And uh, you know, all those, the, my first years in office when we were laying people off and, and uh, you know, city employees, active city employees gave up guaranteed pay raises to save jobs, and yet our retirees each year were getting uh, a, a yeah, pay raise. The, well, but the mayor uh, knows, Gary, that we have the strongest Republican tax-cutting majority in the history of Texas, Fair with question. reformers and such as Paul Bedcourt sitting at the right end. And pension reform is DOA every time we go up there. Uh, you, yeah. and, and what's the, you, know, it's <laughs> you know, it's the interesting <laughs> comment coming from the standpoint of being a conservative Republican and the idea that government should not be involved in, in our lives. Well, then why should the state government be involved in the city's life on pensions. I mean, the state government, to be clear, well, gives you not a dime for your pensions. Do they? <laughs> the state government doesn't give us a dime really much for, of, of anything. Even. There are very, very few state grants. Different in most other states where the cities are funded by the state. Here, uh, there's a, there are some grants that flow through the state, but, but very little. We're our, we're our own taxing entity. But you're looking at a, at a legislature this year that seems determined to do away with local control on any number of issues, not just pensions. <laughs> they want to. They want to take away our ability to prevent uh, water wells near our water sources. They want to take our ability. We don't have a bag ban. We don't have a number of the other things that the legislature seems to be railing about. But legislature seems to believe in local control when they're talking about Washington, but not local control when they're talking about Texas cities. And you know, the most exciting day in Paul Bettencourt's life. He just announced on Facebook. Not his wedding. Was when he <laughs> passed. When he <laughs> passed. The brother of his children. Uh, he, yeah, that, that he has tax reform on his mind. <laughs> tax reform on, and tax relief on his mind. And he says the greatest day in his life is when he passed the amendment that is going to force the mayor of Houston to get 60% of her council to raise revenues if they want to have more revenue coming in from a previous year. Now, how handicapped are you? Or is that just much ado about okay. nothing? We have, a, we have a charter amendment that actually was passed by Bill White that uh, limits uh, our ability to grow faster than inflation and uh, population increase, or 4.5%, whichever is less. So we have a governor. We can't, uh, we can't grow faster than that. The, le the state legislature is dealing with, uh, they're trying to pass something that would affect cities across the state. We already have our own. Yeah, so limitation, so Mayor. Uh, one of the other immature. things I've looked at, and I know you, you, you know, you ran as a reformer, and, and I think you've accomplished a number of significant reforms that uh, most uh, citizens think were a good thing. But one of the things I noticed nobody has touched over the years is the airport concession contract. And when I thought about the city, we just did a new airport. Yeah, concession I understand. Contract. And but one of the problems and historically with the airport concession contracts is the feeding frenzy of politicians and insiders who get their hooks into the different contracts and end up making money on the deal. And what I, what I thought to myself was, I know that you've talked about a lot of things you'd like to be able to have the city do, one of which in terms of re repairing the roads quicker, yeah. if you had the resources, but you're limited by the revenue that comes into the yeah. city. Why, why do we not have, a, not have an airport concession contract where all that extra money that's now flowing to these political insiders okay. goes mm. to the city? Okay, first of all, you have to understand that airports are an enterprise fund. The FAA will not allow us to take money out of the airports and pave roads or build fire stations or do anything else. The airports operate like a business, and in income in, expenses out, it's all self-contained. And the contracting under the airport is governed by federal regulations set by Congress, and they determine the MWBE, uh, they, don't, they don't call it MWBs, I can't remember what it is, but they have a minority contracting provision. What we did to try to do reform of that process, and we just did pass it, is that we broke the contracts down into smaller pieces. Uh, we limited, you, could only, you, you couldn't get more than one uh, like food and beverage contract or one uh, retail contract. So not, you couldn't have one entity come in and get the whole big piece. So we did spread it around a little bit. So one of the problems with the way things are set up, and again, I guess this is another government entity that gets in the way of the city of Houston doing its business, is that the city cannot necessarily or can't benefit from uh, significant profits above and beyond what's needed for the airport based no, on the rules and, and you deal with. And I actually, I, I don't disagree with that because 
Air airports can be cash cows, and cities would be tempted to bleed the airports, and then you end up with uh, public safety issues. Uh, right now, our airport system is a self-contained entity, and we're blowing and going. We have one of the fastest growing airports. We've been bringing in more new international flights than any other airport in the United States. We're now the only the fifth airport in the world that will fly you to uh, all five inhabited continents. Yeah, and, and, and I heard uh, actually on the radio coming over, I heard that there's a new airline that's going to fly from Houston to Taiwan. Uh, <laughs> to, uh, in June, we Eva uh, Airlines. We just, uh, um, you know, last year we brought in uh, a new direct flight to Seoul. Uh, this no, this fall we'll have a new direct flight to Auckland, uh, New Zealand. We just keep adding new flights, and that brings in tourists, but it also brings in business. There's there another cash cow that Gary uh, knows about that is also recently a part of the Betancourt package of reforms, <laughs> and that is the tax increment reinvestment zone bill. <laughs> uh, he he oh, he, no, he's, he's trying to he's trying to kill tax increment reinvestment zones. So the uh, revenue goes to you and the city to spend uh, the way you want. No, actually, and... Uh, so you're against the reform measure that Mr. Betancourt is proposing? I wouldn't call it a reform measure. I would call it an effort to kill tax increment reinvestment zones. They have been very good. For, and he actually finally, uh, he had a broad bill and he kept narrowing it down and now it's bracketed only to hurt Houston. And the reason that it's <laughs> important is that uh, it's probably... I don't know, $150 million worth of infrastructure projects, roads being built across the city of Houston that are being funded through those TURSes. And the money that is in the tax increment reinvestment zones is outside the city's revenue limitations. So it's not that the money would suddenly, we, we dissolve the, the so-called TURSes and the money comes back to Houston. No, we dissolve the TURSes and the money goes away. Well, his, his bill is not retroactive. He's just saying and for all new TERS, there's a 10-year limit. And well, you would, it effectively kills them because the, the, the way TERSs work is that you, you draw a circle around an area and you say, the city's made whole. All the taxes we're currently receiving, we get to continue to receive. But you pledge the, the future tax revenue in that zone for infrastructure bonds. And you sell the bonds and you do whatever infrastructure, you put water lines or you put the streets in, you do you drainage work, whatever, and you pay it back with the infrastructure, the, the you put the, the infrastructure in, it brings up the property values and you pay back the bonds with the increased uh, tax revenue. But his goal is to limit those TERSes to a 10-year lifespan. Well, you can't, you can't get good uh, bond financing. Uh, on with that short of a time frame. Number one issue that uh, most uh, citizens of Houston are dealing with is deteriorating infrastructure <laughs> in the transportation area. We talked about this, of course, on your last a visit, lot. and I showed you, to your credit, I showed you a picture of a pothole, and I think it was fixed within three days. So that was, <laughs> like you had said, if you tell me where it is, we'll get it done. But we have a problem in, in, the, in the Houston area survey. Number Decades one issue, transportation. Well, but that's different mm -hmm. from, from infrastructure. What was interesting to me in the Houston area survey if people are complaining about traffic, it means that things are going pretty well. You're growing. Catch 22. It's, <laughs> no, it's one thing. If people are complaining about about crime or, or crumbling infrastructure or the bad economy, uh, you're in trouble. But traffic, that's a that's a that's a problem of prosperity. So what is? Uh, but you deal with it by uh, and and the, like the big traffic. That's, that's not a, you know, are you fixing the potholes issue? That is, do you have a good bus system? Do you have a mass transit system? Are you building the freeways where they need to be built, and are you maintaining the freeways? So freeways are, again, they're, the state has the freeways. I don't have the freeways. But we're, we're about to open two new light rail lines, uh, in fact, this month in, in May. And uh, the, later this year, one of the things I pledged as a candidate, and Gary, you'll remember this, was to overhaul the bus system. It's taken a while, but we're going to have a completely new bus uh, route system that's going to come out this summer, and it, it truly will be transformative. Let's talk about a couple of social issues. One of them is the Equal Rights Ordinance. Is that going to remain with us, or will it be ultimately defeated? What is your, what <laughs> I think is it's your gonna, view? I obviously think it's going to remain with us. You know, it's interesting. We passed it through council. The anti-folks brought a petition in. They didn't meet the minimum requirements. They thought they did. They demanded a jury trial. Jury agreed with the city that they didn't meet the minimum requirements. Judge looked at it. Judge agreed with the city they didn't meet the minimum requirements. And they've lost three times, but now they've appealed, and uh, who knows? 
uh, I remain confident that if it were on the ballot, particularly the Houston survey seems to indicate that Houstonians would, uh, would support it. But I'm not going to throw something on the ballot just to throw something on the ballot. No one should have the right to vote on my civil rights. I but have civil rights. I you should know, be able to exercise those civil rights. From a political rights. standpoint, though, you ha you'd probably agree with me. It really throws, if, if it is indeed on the ballot in November, it throws a curveball into all the races. And I know we're talking about the state of the city, but it, from a, and you're a political observer and observed for a long time, it really creates some interesting situations it for would. candidates for the first round where you'd, the vote would be on the, the hero or everybody, ordinance. But everybody's Second round already, would be different. Everybody's already taken a, a position uh, on the ordinance. So the, of the candidates that are out there to date, um, uh, you have w one that's actively uh, opposed to it. That would be Ben Hall. I think uh, Bill King doesn't like it, but he's not beating the drum on it, and everybody else is supporting it. The other, the other social issue mayor is uh, do black lives matter? I have read... I have read a 42-page okay. okay. report. Black lives matter? Yeah, black lives. Do they matter? Black lives matter. Yes, yes. Did he just... I don't think he Let said Let me ask lies. you this. No. Do, you know not, well. do you know whether or not okay. the Houston Police Department... I, didn't make it sin I, I don't want to make a joke of it. Yes, Black Lives Matter, and that is a huge issue across the country now, right now because it's not that suddenly we have more shootings of young men of color, but what we have is uh, an amplification process to, to spread the information about those shootings, both the major media but social media, and that's... It's changing the, the conversation. Well, and, and, you, and I think you're supportive of uh, body cameras for the police. Uh, we committed to body cameras two years ago. We two piloted ahead them. of the curve. Uh, we were ahead, before Ferguson happened, we were, we were piloting body cams. It's a matter of, of uh, we just finished the, the pilot project. We're, we're in the RFP process, and uh, by the end of the year, we'll have body cams. Even if we had a Ferguson in Houston, the question would remain. Do you require, and does the police department voluntarily report every shooting involving a police officer to the Justice Department? Because unless they do, we have no idea how well we're doing. Okay. Do you know whether or not HPD no, reports? No, we do not report every shooting, every time a gun is fired, no. Uh, nor do we, no, the, the short answer. However, we have a, an independent civ civilian review board that looks at every use of force complaint, and not just shootings, but use of force complaint within the Houston Police Department. They also look at every discharge of firearm within the Houston Police Department. There are uh, seven civilians on each. Uh, we have four panels, uh, seven people each, and, and so each one of those incidents is reviewed by a civilian, in addition to the folks within the Houston Police Department. Now, any possible flashpoint shooting or, again, use of force, because it's not just about shootings. The, uh, the uh, most recent Baltimore incident uh, was not a shooting. Uh, those, we immediately call in the Justice Department every time we have an incident like that. And in fact, we don't wait until the, the protests start. Uh, the police chief gets on the phone to the Justice Department. Now, but it's not as if the Justice Department suddenly swoops in and takes over the investigation. What they do is say, Keep a record, and we will review what you do, and we'll tell you if it's sufficient. Uh, Mayor, let's uh, let's talk about the state of the police department. Are you happy with the state of the police department today? Do you think we have enough police on the street? Do you think the police are performing at the level of your expectations? I think we have an outstanding police department. I think we could use a lot more police officers. We have a challenge in the fact that half the police department is retirement eligible. Ooh. It's a serious challenge, and we've been trying, you know, one of the reasons that I, I, I've been criticized a lot because we've been uh, working to bring up the pay of uh, our police officers. Well, part of that is to keep them on the job longer, but also is to make it uh, a, a place where people want to work. We were having to pay hiring bonuses uh, the last couple of years just to get people to come in, so we've been you know, pumping up the pay. Uh, however... One of the things that I don't think our police department has done as well as some other departments, but although we're, you know, we're one of the largest departments in the in the country, and you know, we're a big bureaucracy and takes a while, it is to use technology to the best of our ability. Something like body cams, we're way out in front. Tasers, we were we were way out in front. 
but uh, predictive analytics, we've been slow to come to that. And I, and I think that's an opportunity for the next chief to come in and do that. The, uh, Gary insists on talking about the police department, and I'm happy to do for so. For David, that's like money ball police for department police is, officers. Uh, yeah. The police department is one-third of the city's general fund budget. Of course we should be talking about the police department. When you add the fire department and the court <laughs> system, that's two-thirds of what we spend. We ought to be talking a lot more about it. Well, so how much how much of uh, your budget is is coming out of the the fines and court costs that are uh, administered about 1 by one percent? So so we can't we can't we can't say that. <laughs> how about David would be we're not balancing the budget on, David on your want, traffic. Ticket. David wants yeah. to know if the legislature would make marijuana a, t a traffic ticket that would go to this court. How much would that be worth to the city? Yeah, uh, not a whole lot. I, actually, I think we ought to. Uh, we ought to be, it ought to be a ticket rather than an arrest because it's a lot cheaper. For the city? For the city. We, we never, we don't make it, we don't make enough in fines to cover the cost of arresting somebody. We never have. We had a major, uh, you had a major disappointment about a year, a year and a half ago when basically the homicide department just was in a state of collapse. A major investigation, a lot of people disciplined. One uh, homicide supervisor and person who worked with him had, deci had apparently decided he was going to stop doing his job. What, what should have happened is that it should have been caught sooner. And uh, there was a lot of, uh, some heads rolled over in the police department. Well, you know, that. so let me ask you this. The chief announced at the, at, when he said this uh, investigation is complete and I am firing one of them, that crimes were committed. Now the arbitrator's report, which I just read and which was just released, just gives the same information. Crimes were committed. So do you know whether or not your chief of police attempted to file a complaint, a criminal oh. complaint against that officer? Uh, David, you know that that's up to the DA. It's actually not up to... The, we fired the guy and, and we turn over our information to the district. You're Defense attorney, we f we turn over our information to the to the DA, and it is up to the district attorney to decide whether to, to prosecute. Now, this is an area that's much beyond the, the, the police department, but I think that I would love to see an independent prosecutor for police abuse cases, but also cases against police officers. And there's a, a Rodney Ellis has a bill to that. That we've accomplished. I'm sure, that. It won't see any light of day in Austin. Uh, Mayor, let's talk about this, the economy. How's the city economy doing overall? <laughs> and where, we're what, what, where would you like breath? the barrel of oil to be? Priced? We're about $180 a barrel. <laughs> well, it, it went over 60, went so over that's 60. progress. We're holding our breath. Uh, we're still growing, uh, but we're, we're growing at about half the rate we were a year ago. And uh, oh, the companies that are in trouble, the oil companies that are in trouble, are the ones that were over leveraged. They had too much debt. Uh, other companies are using it as a buying opportunity, and fortunately, we're not uh, the company town anymore. It's it's a huge, it's the largest part of our economy, but we have America's largest import-export port, and uh, we we have uh, the Texas Medical Center. We have we're the largest and fastest-growing manufacturing region in the United States. Some of that is oil-related, but it. We've broadened our economy, and so we, we continue to be the beneficiary of uh, a lot of growth and, and uh, people coming in from all over the, the world. How has the economy, what's happened with oil, affected the city's projected revenues? Well, like I said, uh, the, our growth has been cut in, in half, and so we've, we've cut our sales tax projection in half, for example. Uh, property taxes are, are fairly stable, and in fact, property taxes are capped under our revenue limitation uh, anyway. So, uh, very little change year over year. Uh, we're actually in the budget process. We have to pass the budget next month. So, uh, it's, it's, it, it's very uh, slow. Know, normally, normally the mayor, uh, when a politician is about to leave office, they're called lame ducks. Yeah. And uh, so, I'm interested in whether or not you're getting along well with a council that no longer has to worry about seeing you after uh, November. Um, Are there more struggles now as a result of the <laughs> lame duckness? <laughs> <laughs> lame duckness. I don't. I don't think so. Uh, and it, it's not so much that. I mean, this is still the strong mayor system. And uh, you know, if you're happy with the city, you can be happy with me. If you're not happy with the city, you can be unhappy mm -hmm. with me. Mm -hmm. And, and okay. I still hold uh, uh, the lion's share of the power in the in the city. And that is, it is what it is. Uh, but the other thing I would say is that I'm not trying to cram uh, a bunch of new things in, in in my last six months in office. 
Uh, there's not uh, there's not a tremendous number of new initiatives. That council members aren't going to find out something dropped on them that, that uh, they've never heard of from me right, before. Final question, Mayor. we got so. 10 seconds. Future plans. I don't know. I don't know. I, I hope this is not my last uh, opportunity to serve the public. But, uh, you know, the statewide races, the county races are, are 2018. So I'm going to have to have something to do uh, uh, next year when I'm out of office. Well, we'll have you back on the show, county right? County judge. County judge. Stay tuned, right? Thank you, Mayor. Stay tuned. Thanks. Thank Thanks. you, Mayor Parker. And remember, you can catch Red, White, and Blue every Friday at 7.30 p.m. right here on TV8. And again, Saturdays at 6.30 p.m. We also invite you to visit us online and send us your comments. We want to hear what you are saying about the issues that affect Houston. You can submit your comments at HoustonPublicMedia.org or on Facebook. And while you're there, don't forget to like us. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you again next week. Good night.